Good evening. It's good to see everybody who's made it out to our, our mid, midweek service. Um, and as Jonathan mentioned, we're going to continue our, uh, our study. Oh, before I get ahead of myself, thank you for the prayers, Caleb, um, and really appreciate it. And we will uh, get through it this evening together. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, we are going to continue our study in the book of Exodus this evening. Uh, and our topic is kind of the, the excuses of Moses, but I've chosen to title our sermon, What is That in Your Hand? Um, and hopefully by the end, the, the reason for that will become clear. And so just a little bit of context. Um, I know we've had a, a bunch of introductory sermons already, so I won't spend too terribly long here. But my section uh, deals with Moses talking to God at the, at the burning bush. And so that picks up in about the middle of, of chapter 3. Uh, and my section this evening is chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. But I wanted to back up and get the full picture uh, of this conversation here. And so, you know, God has called Moses uh, at the burning bush to lead the children of Israel out of, out of Egyptian bondage. And, you know, that is uh, a, a very tall task to ask of someone. And... Moses has some initial pushback in chapter 3 there um, and some, some doubt of himself. You know, and the first question that Moses asks of God in chapter 3 is one that I think is, is very understandable. Um, you know, Moses is asking God, who am I to lead your people out of captivity? You know, the, the Egyptian nation at this point in time, um, through researching the sermon and, and the book of Exodus, I've... There are some historians that believe that Egypt was the, the first true superpower in the world. And so Moses is saying, you know, who, who am I? I'm a shepherd at this point in my life. I've, I was in Egypt and I had an issue with the taskmaster and I've been a shepherd for a while. And so why, you know, why me? Who am I to lead your people out? And I think that's a, a very understandable question to ask. I think uh, a lot of us would feel the same way. Um, and God has an answer for that question. We see in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, God said, but I will be with you. And that, that answer should be sufficient. Um, that should have been enough for Moses. However, I guess if that were enough for Moses, we probably wouldn't have a sermon on this topic. So he does go on and push back a little bit further and asks, you know, well, who do I tell them? Who do I tell the children of Israel sent me? Because I've been gone for a long time. They don't know me. Um, so who do I tell them sent me? And, you know, whenever God goes to answer this question, in my head, in my mind, if you'll allow me um, my imagination, it's almost like God's like, you know, that first answer should have been enough, but it wasn't. And so why don't I just lay out exactly the next few months of your life for you? And that's exactly what God does in Exodus chapter 3. Um, and we'll start in verse 15, and we'll go ahead and read that, that passage there. Bible says, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then pay attention here in, in verse 18. God says, and they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say in him, the Lord, or say to him, excuse me, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask her of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. So this is the end of, of chapter 3, is God gives a very um, kind of stepwise approach to how the next few months are going to go. And notice the, uh, the audacity of Moses in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. You know, he's just been told by God himself, 
that the people will listen to you. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, the very next words out of Moses' mouth are, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, but they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. And I, I feel like this chapter, um, this fourth chapter of Exodus represents a little bit of a tone shift in the conversation between Moses and God. You know, throughout the third chapter, Moses asked a couple of questions of God, um, and it seems to be a good faith dialogue there. You know, Moses has some concerns, God addresses them. Moses stops asking questions in the fourth chapter. Moses starts bringing excuses. And so as you go through, or as we go through this fourth chapter, it really stuck out to me how much Moses is focused on himself. He's not focused on allowing himself to be a tool for God to use. He's focused on himself. And so in answer to this concern, um, God in his wisdom gives Moses three different signs or miracles that he can perform to the children of Israel in order to establish his credibility. And we see the first one here in uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 2, the very next verse. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it and it became, in, I mean, it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So whenever I was reading through this story, um, and and my mom can probably attest to this, I am a very curious person. I I ask why. It's probably my favorite question. I want to know why. And so as I was reading through this, the staff made sense to me. Why, why the staff? Well, that's something that a shepherd would have had on hand right there with him. So it makes sense that, that God would use that as um, a sort of a, a tool um, in his miracles. But I, I wondered why a serpent? You know, why not a bird or a cricket or what, what was particular about a serpent? And so I started digging a little bit deeper into some symbolism and things like that. And I was Um, I want to give some credit to Caleb. I was uh, inspired by a lesson he gave a while ago about the the plagues that God uh, set upon the the people of Egypt and how they correlated to God's um, that the Egyptians would have understood and that God was asserting his dominance over uh, the false gods of the Egyptians. And I started digging a little bit and found that there was a a goddess uh, that the ancient Egyptians worshipped that was always depicted or are always depicted as a serpent, sometimes with wings uh, as the picture there, um, but, or other times just as a snake. Um, and that goddess's name is Wajet. And she represented to the Egyptian people uh, the, the sovereignty and the uh, power of Pharaoh. In fact, there are times in, in different images and hieroglyphs that I had seen where uh, that wadjet is actually pictured as it looks almost like a staff and straight vertical uh, and is out in front of Pharaoh, kind of lighting Pharaoh's way. And so to the ancient Egyptians, I believe that this goddess was a symbol that Pharaoh was on par with deity. And, you know, whenever God is um, asserting his dominance over a serpent by having it turned from a staff and then back into, or from a staff into a serpent and then back into a staff, I think he's accomplishing two goals with that message. The first is the easiest to see, in my opinion, which is he's establishing Moses' credibility. Um, you and I can't pick up a staff and turn it into a serpent, and so there had to be he's uh, there had to be some kind of divine intervention for that to happen. But I think also. God is affirming to the children of Israel Moses' message, which is that he will deliver them from bondage. You know, if you were one of those children of Israel, it would be, I would think, a pretty hard reality to accept after years of slavery um, and and your workload has ramped up, as we've talked about. It may not, even if you do believe that Moses is sent from God, it may be hard to to wrap your head around uh, that that is the message that Moses is trying to deliver. So the second sign that uh, God gives to Moses is recorded uh, the very next verse in verse 6. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his coat, 
And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. So again, kind of in keeping with our theme, I asked, why, why leprosy? Um, you know, there's other things that God could have done to uh, show, um, you know, restoration. But why in particular leprosy? And so I started digging into that a little bit and found uh, a story in, later in Numbers, uh, chapter 12. And this is later on in Moses' life. He has taken a wife, a Cushite wife. And uh, Aaron and this lady Miriam both take issue with that and question Moses' judgment in that. And God makes it very clear to Miriam that Moses was called by him and is not to be questioned. She's elevating herself to the level of Moses by questioning his judgment. And as punishment for that, God afflicts her with leprosy for seven days. So she has to stay outside of the camp and the children of Israel wait on her to become clean and then leave. And so, and there are a few other examples throughout the Old Testament of, of the Lord using leprosy as a, a punishment of humility or to, to bring you back down to the level that you should be at. And I think that may have been um, part of why leprosy was chosen here. And, you know, the Egyptian pharaohs, as we've already talked about a little bit, the Egyptian people and the Egyptian pharaohs themselves considered themselves to be gods. Uh, and so that is obviously, I think God is, is maybe communicating a little bit of symbolism here that the pharaohs are not God and that he will ultimately subjugate them as well. And then the last sign that, uh, that God gives to Moses is, he, is recorded in verse 9 there. It says, If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So as I read this third, um, this third sign or third miracle, it, it became very clear that this is a preview of what would ultimately be the first plague uh, inflicted upon the Egyptians. And, you know, the, the importance of the Nile, I think it's, it's relevant that it's not just any water, it's water that comes from the Nile uh, that turns to blood. You know, the, the, to the ancient Egyptians, the Nile was their lifeblood. Um, it, was, it was everything to them. There's only about three inches or a little bit less than three inches of annual rainfall in Egypt per year. So that water was the fresh water that they had available to them. In addition to being a source of fresh water, there's also, uh, that was the way that, that trade was conducted through for the Egyptians. They would trade down the Nile um, and that was a, a thoroughfare for commerce as well. And so that importance would not be lost on anyone living there, not just the Egyptians, but also uh, the children of Israel while they were in captivity. They depended on that Nile every bit as much as the Egyptians did while they were there. And in fact, that the Nile was so important to Egypt, uh, as I was researching this lesson, I came across a gentleman who considers himself to be an Egyptologist, which is not something that I knew existed before studying for this sermon, but his name's Toby Wilkinson, and he wrote a book called The Nile, and one of his quotes from that is, without the Nile, there would be no Egypt. So I think that was God, um, once again, showing the children of Israel his power uh, over his creation. And I think there is, like we've said, there's some symbolism here. You know, the first miracle that God gives, our first sign, is tra of transformation. God is asserting his sovereignty over Egypt um, with that serpent being chosen as the as the uh, the animal there the second i believe is a is a miracle of restoration is what i've chosen to or chosen to call that um you know god takes something that was unclean and returns it back to clean and i think that's god um expressing his his desire for reunification with the children of israel and then finally, we have what I've called the miracle of judgment, which is the, the blood or the water turning into blood. And I think the, this is actually a, a bit of a warning to the children of Israel. Uh, I think you can kind of read between the lines here and see that this is their last chance to accept Moses, the third sign. And if they don't, that they will suffer a similar fate um, to the Egyptians. So, after those three signs, Moses immediately fires back with another excuse. 
In verse 10, it says, But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. You know, I, um, as I was reading through this, uh, it became obvious to me that this is, it kind of sounds humble to be, you know, I'm just, I'm not the best speaker. There's got to be somebody better for this important task that you've laid out. And I really, I don't think it's humility. I think it's fear. And he's trying to kind of trick, not trick God, but he's trying to talk his way out of this situation that he doesn't want to be in, you know, and God's answer to that is that he knows our limitations. He knows he made us. He knows what we're capable of, and he calls us accordingly. He's not going to call us to something that we can't handle, and as Moses is about to find out, unfortunately, God also knows our intentions and handles us accordingly. So as we continue, we finally get now, uh, in, in verse 13, we finally get to Moses being truthful with God, I think. In verse 13, but he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff, which also you shall do the signs, or with which you shall do the signs. You know, Moses is finally out of excuses. This isn't an excuse. This this is just, I don't want to go. And, you know, this is, I believe this is how Moses felt the whole time, Uh, asking questions, gathering information. I think he truly did not want to go. He, uh, I think fear of rejection probably played a part, um, fear of, of leaving the life that he had built there in Midian. Um, but I don't believe that, that Moses ever wanted to go. And I think it's interesting and, and worth noting that God seemed to be okay with the, the good faith dialogue. You know, it, I don't think um, God didn't, God's anger was not kindled against Moses the second he talked back or asked a question. It was whenever he finally got down to the truth of his intentions, which is that he didn't want to go. And one other thing that I'd like to point out, you know, my first reading through this, it, it was hard for me not to read this as Moses doesn't want to talk in front of people. And he kind of negotiated his way out of talking in front of people. Um, and so did he, did he strong arm God into something? I don't think that that's the case anymore after studying this a little bit closer. I think Moses truly did not want to go. He didn't want to go as the mouthpiece. He didn't want to, he didn't want to go, period. And so um, I think it's important to note that God's will was done. God's will was for Moses to go to Egypt and lead the children out of Egyptian captivity, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the only thing that changed is that Moses uh, well, spent about a chapter and a half arguing with God. Uh, and still ended up right where he was. So as we finish up this conversation with God, I'd like to look for um, some applications that we can apply to our lives. You know, whenever we think of the gospel, I think I personally have at times uh, had or or felt the sentiment that for such an important and, and the most important message shouldn't the messenger be the best of the best you know there are plenty of people in this room tons of people in this room that that are are more knowledgeable than me that are better spoken than me why why should i be the one to deliver that message if it is such an important message and that's that's an attitude that i deal with a little bit in my um professional life outside of here uh the the practice i work at sees a lot of special needs patients um and this is not a, a one-to-one comparison because I, I do advocate for if you're not comfortable doing something medically, if you're a medical provider, do not get out over your skis doing that. But there are, um, 
these special needs patients that we see oftentimes are not seen by general practitioners anywhere else. Um, they go to specialists, they go to pediatric specialists um, for the most part. And the reason for that, if you ask some of these general dentists that won't see those patients, is that they want everyone to have the best care possible and they feel like some of those special needs patients can receive a higher level of care outside of their office. And like I said, I am not in any way, shape, or form advocating against that in a medical sense. However, whenever we're talking about the gospel, we are the specialists. There's, not, there's, nobody, uh, there's nobody else. There's no, we are the ones that have been given this message and are to take it out to the world. So there's nobody else. And, and if you're struggling with that, then I think it, it helps me at least to take a step back and, and stop focusing so much on the messenger and start focusing on the message and making sure that we deliver that as we're called to. You know, and, and secondly, now we've got to the, to the title of the sermon. <clears throat> you know, God was calling on Moses to lead the Egyptian, or to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. You know, that would have been, to me, could have been easier if Moses never left Pharaoh's house. Um, could have maybe got a sympathetic ear to Pharaoh and, and handled this a different way. But I think it's important to realize that God doesn't wait for us for everything to be perfect. God calls us where we're at. And, you know, today, I think we should all ask ourselves, what is that in our hand? You know, it may be a hammer. You might be working construction, or it may be a baby on your hip, or it may be some books. Uh, maybe you're a student, and that's what, or maybe you're me, and you just pulled a tooth, and you've got that in your hand. But regardless of what's in your hand, um, and where you're at in life, God can and will use you to bring about his plan. And when he does call you, and when you hear that call, it's so important to have Isaiah's attitude and not Moses. Don't ask, please send someone else. Have Isaiah's attitude as he does in Isaiah 6 and verse 8. <clears throat> he says, and I heard the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Those are the thoughts that I've prepared this evening. Um, if there are any here who would like the prayers of the church or any who would like to answer that call uh, and be baptized and join the Lord in baptism, we ask that you would please come forward and have a seat on the front while we stand and sing our invitation song.